Good morning. If you would open your Bible to the book of Psalms and Psalm 22. We have finished 1st and 2nd Timothy and we are starting a new series through the book of Psalms. And so we're going to start in Psalm 22 here. The title of the sermon this morning is Abandoned by God. And I'll explain where I get that from in just a moment here. Uh, I'll be reading the text as we go through it and as I preach through it, kind of verse by verse or passage by passage, uh, uh, group of verses together. Uh, so uh, just hold off on reading it for right now, but we'll go through it. Um, but if you will join me in a, a word of prayer as, as we uh, ask for God to bless this time as we go through this um, over the next year or so. So please pray with me. <clears throat> Lord, I, uh, I ask now as we study your word, that you would help me to, to speak it very clearly and distinctly and with passion and conviction and humility. Lord, it, this is uh, your word. This is about you, and um, I ask that you help me to remember that now, God, as I preach this, that it's not about us, it's not about me, it's not about this, even this church ultimately, God, but this is all about you and your glory and us enjoying that and us um, uh, experiencing it on a level that helps us to, to love you and to know you and to help others know you and love you. God, especially this week as we get ready for Good Friday and Easter, Lord, help us to, to meditate on the truths of, of Psalm 22 this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're uh, beginning a new series on the book of Psalms, and uh, I picked out 50 Psalms out of the 150 and we will be doing one chapter a week over the next year. So we'll be in this till at least April or May of next year. Now you may be wondering, why are we starting in Psalm 22? I'll explain that in just a few moments. Uh, but before we begin, let me give, uh, you may be wondering, what is a psalm? You know, if you're, and maybe you've never thought about that before. What is a psalm? Well, a psalm, the Hebrew word is tehillim. Uh, and that word means praises. Psalms are, are literally praises or songs of praise. So we could call this book, the Hebrew would hear it as praises rather than psalms. These psalms were originally sung in public worship. Uh, at times they were even prayed and used as prayers. Uh, the book of Psalms was written around the 10th through the 9th century, so around 1900 B.C. They were written by David. Mostly by David, but not completely. Uh, Solomon, Asaph, Moses even wrote one, sons of Korah, or they were anonymous. Now, Psalm 22 is written either about David, uh, inspired by David, or is literally written by David. We don't know, uh, but at least, at the very least, it was inspired by the life of David. The Zondervan Study Bible has a nice summary of this book. Uh, I want to read it for you, it'll be on the screen. Uh, the book of Psalms contains the entire range of human emotion, from the highest points of joy and thanksgiving to the lowest points of depression and loss, and everything in between. The Psalms are timeless, hence their popularity among believers in all times and all places. Their presence in the Bible instructs the faithful in the best ways to praise and thank God, and they model, I love this, they model legitimate ways to grieve and to address God boldly and directly in the midst of pain and sorrow. The, psalmist are, the Psalms are transparent, they're passionate, they're emotive, they're personal, they're genuine, and they provide believers with language with which to express their own deepest emotions and passions. The Psalms are originally written as poems. I want you to keep that in mind over the next year as we go through this. And as we go through the book of Psalms over the next year, I will be giving you what I'll be calling tools. Last week, we, uh, one of our core values, we talked about equipping, uh, wanting to equip everybody to serve. Now, the Psalms won't necessarily, necessarily equip you to serve, but they will equip you and, and everyone here to know God, to know God uniquely and deeply, to know God through our emotions and our experience, and they will equip you to know yourself. 
One of the things we know about Psalms is that the book of Psalms is mostly a book written about man speaking to God and praising God rather than God speaking to us. And so it, consequently, it helps us to know ourselves and to know our own emotions. So let's jump in to our very first Psalm that I've, I, uh, I've ever uh, preached. Oh, no, I preached on one other Psalm one time in this church, but um, second Psalm I've ever preached on and our first Psalm in this series, Psalm 22. We're going to go through this verse by verse or uh, kind of chunk of verses by chunk of verses because um, there's a lot in this book. Psalm 22, let's look at verse 1. The psalmist begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Now, anybody who has ever read the Gospels before will immediately think of our Savior's agonizing words as he hung upon the cross. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason why we are starting in Psalm 22 is because this Friday we celebrate what we call Good Friday, the day that our Savior hung upon a cross for my sin and for your sin, for my punishment and for your punishment. And Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, quoted the first line of this psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, before we move on, I want to answer four questions. Here they are. Number one, what does it mean for God to forsake somebody? Number two, did God, in fact, forsake the psalmist? Number three, did God, in fact, forsake Jesus? And number four, will God ever forsake me? So let's look at those individually. Number one, what does it mean for God to forsake somebody? Where the Hebrew word for forsake, it means to leave or to abandon. It's used 211 times in the Old Testament. So it's a fairly common idea or thought in the Old Testament. Now, it doesn't always carry a negative sense. In Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave. That word leave there is the same word. Therefore a man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife. And that's not a good, I mean, that's not a bad leaving. That's a good leaving. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And so that's not a bad idea. Uh, but it often carries a negative context. In Judges, Judges 2.13, they abandoned the Lord and clung to the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So normally this idea is a negative sense. To forsake something means to leave it or to abandon it. Number two, did God in fact forsake the psalmist? The psalmist is plainly asking here, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that raises the question, well, did God forsake him? No, God did not. God has specifically told his people, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Joshua 1, 5. God told him, I will not do this. So the question is, well, then if God didn't, and the psalmist knows this, which I think he does, why does he ask, why have you forsaken me? And the first tool that I will give you as we go through this, and I'll give you many tools over the next year, the first tool in understanding and applying the Psalms is this. Tool number one, just because a psalmist feels something does not make it objectively true. Just because a psalmist feels something does not make it objectively true. As we go through the book of Psalms, we will see the human emotions peeled back. Over and over again, we will see the raw and unfiltered emotions of the psalmist. And just because he feels something doesn't make it true. That's true for us too, right? How many times have we ever said something in our minds or in our hearts? God, why don't you care about me? God, why don't you love me? God, why are you making my life so difficult? None of those are true. None of those are ever true. Even though it's true that we feel them. The psalmist feels as though God has forsaken him. But in fact, God has not. We will see that in the coming verses. Now, question three. Did God in fact forsake Jesus? 
When Jesus hung about the cross, he said these words. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God the Father forsake his son? And the answer is, yes, he did. I don't think it will do to say that Jesus felt forsaken by God, but wasn't objectively forsaken. Or that Jesus mistakenly thought that God forsook him. While Jesus hung upon the cross, he was, in fact, abandoned by God. This is what makes the cross so horrific for Jesus. I'll never forget what I read by David Platt in one of his books. Uh, it won't be on the screen because it's pretty long, but just uh, bear with me, okay? This is what David Platt writes in one of his books. Picture Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he kneels before his father, drops of sweat and blood fall together from his head. Why is he in such agony and pain? The answer is not because he's afraid of the crucifixion. He is not trembling because of what Roman soldiers are about to do to him. Since that day, countless men and women in the history of Christianity have died for the faith. Some of them were not just on crosses. They were burned there. Many of them went to their crosses singing. One Christian in India, while being skinned alive, looked at his persecutors and said, I thank you for this. Tear off my old garment, for I will soon put on Christ's garment of righteousness. As he prepared to head to his execution, Christopher Love wrote a note to his wife saying, Today they will sever me physically from my head. But they cannot sever me from my spiritual head, Christ. As he walked to his death, his wife applauded while he sang of glory. Did these men and women of the Christian faith have more courage than Christ himself? Why was he trembling in that garden, weeping and full of anguish? We can rest assured he was not a coward. About to face the Roman soldiers. Instead, he was a savior about to endure divine wrath. Listen to his words. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. The cup is not a reference to a wooden cross. It is a reference to divine judgment. It is the cup of God's wrath. This is what Jesus is recoiling from in the garden. All God's holy wrath and hatred towards sin and sinners stored up since the beginning of the world is about to be poured out on him and he is sweating blood at the thought of it. What happened on the cross was not primarily about nails being thrust into Jesus' hands and feet, but about the wrath due your sin and my sin being thrust upon his soul. In that holy moment, all the righteous wrath and justice of God do us came rushing down like a torrent on Christ himself. Some say God looked down and he couldn't bear to see the suffering of the soldiers inflicting on Jesus, so he turned away. But that is not true. God turned away because he could not bear to see your sin and my sin on his son. Jesus was abandoned, quote, end of quote. Jesus was abandoned by his father because of us and for us. Question four, will God ever forsake me? No. No. Praise Jesus, no. Amen. The author of Hebrews writes, I will not leave you or forsake you. My God, my God, why have you forsake me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Here the psalmist asks two more questions. The first one, my God, why have you forsaken me? Two, why are you so far from saving me? And number three, why are you so far from the words of my groaning? This is one of the themes that we encounter in the Psalms, that God often feels distant, doesn't he? Removed, 
or worse and different? And it often only gets worse. Verse 2, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Have you ever prayed and felt like God wasn't listening? Or that he didn't care? You're not alone. This problem is as old as the Bible. Since the beginning of time, people have felt as though God was distant from them. Or that he didn't care about them. I find this interesting that the psalmist writes these words in verse 2, considering that five times the psalmist had written the exact opposite. I called and you answered. Psalm 3, Psalm 86, Psalm 118, Psalm 120, and Psalm 138. They're all on the screen for you. We are reminded that it's very easy in the moment of emotion and despair and discouragement to forget how faithful God has been to answer us. Verse 3 through 5, yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel and you our fathers trusted they trusted and you delivered them to you they cried and were rescued and you they trusted and were not put to shame this word yet or the word but uh, I want to draw your special attention to those words in the Psalms the second tool that I'll give you to understanding and applying the book of Psalms look for those contrasting words yet or but. They permeate all throughout the book of Psalms. They are a pivotal key to finding hope in the Christian walk. Listen, if you are ever struggling in your walk uh, to find hope, or even if you're not a Christian and you're struggling to find hope, go to the book of Psalms and look for these words, yet or but. We'll see this contrast all throughout the book of Psalms. The contrast of the circumstances of life versus the character of the Lord. The contrast of the despair and circumstances versus the deliverance in God. The contrast of the hopelessness of circumstances versus the hope in God. The contrast of judgment and circumstances versus joy in God. You will see that contrast all throughout the book of Psalms. This psalmist feels as though God has forsaken him, that God is far from saving him, that God doesn't care about his groanings, that God is not answering his cries. That's what it feels like. Yet, yet, he remembers the Lord. He remembers the Lord is holy. He is enthroned. He delivers their ancestors. He listened to their cry and they were not put to shame. Verse 5 is my favorite verse in this chapter. I like how the NIV words it. It says, they cried to you and were saved and you they trusted and were not disappointed. I've never been disappointed in following God. Never. I've been frequently disappointed when I trusted in my own strength, in my own power, in my own ability, in my own success, in my own will. But I've never been disappointed in trusting in the Lord. This is how Jesus suffered on the cross. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Friend, I want to encourage you. It's okay to be honest with God. It's okay to be honest with God. One of the things that I love about the book of Psalms is the brutal honesty of the psalmist. I mean, it's pretty brutal to suggest some of these things in verses 1 and 2, is it not? Especially when you're accusing God of these things. Be honest with God about how you feel. 
You feel angry? Be honest with God that you're angry. You feel sad? Be honest with God that you're sad. You feel neglected? Be honest with God about how you feel. It's okay to be honest with God, but don't stay with how you feel. Don't stay there. Contrast your feelings with the truth of God. Contrast your circumstances of life with the character of the Lord. That's how you find hope. That's how you get out of depression. Verse 6 to 8. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me, they mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. As is often the case in life, we ride the roller coaster of emotions. Psalmist starts off on a down note, goes to a high note, goes back to a down note. You'll see this all throughout the book of Psalms. After just remembering who the Lord is, verse 3 to 5, he just got through saying how great God is, how entrusting God is, and then he returns right back. Isn't that us? The psalmist returns to describing the circumstance. His friends or acquaintances or perhaps his enemies, they look at him with scorn. They look at him with disdain. They mock him. They insult him. They shake their head at him. You know, it's kind of like you see, you're like, Stephen does that all the time. They shake their head at him. Shakes his head, not like at people's plight. Uh. In Psalm 18, 9, the psalmist said, He rescued me. Because he delighted in me. And now they use the psalmist's own words against him. They come to him they say, God will rescue him. After all, he delights in him. You can hear the sarcasm. We even see this psalm fulfilled in Jesus on the cross. Matthew 27, and those who passed by, they derided him. They wagged their heads at him or they shook their heads at Jesus saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders, they mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot even save himself. He is the king of Israel. So he says, let him come down from the cross. If he provides scientific, verifiable proof and evidence, then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now. If he desires him, he said that his father desired him, then let his father save him. For he said, I am the son of God. No. Mm Mm-mm. Just as this psalmist is suffering, so Jesus was willing to come down to earth to identify with us in our suffering. Verse 9 to 11. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Here is our word yet, yet again. I like that the psalmist doesn't seek to affirm his self-worth. You know, when people mock us or they treat us like worms or scorn us or despise us, we typically have one of two reactions. A, we protect self by withdrawing into self. Or B, we promote self by boasting in self. That's typically the one of two reactions that we have when people look down on us. But these are both flaws in that they both look to self to solve our problems. Here, the psalmist looks to God. Rather than wallowing in his self-pity, or rather seeking to prove his mockers wrong, he humbly acknowledges, I am dependent on God. 
like a newborn baby who has no choice but to trust his mother. I have nobody else to trust but God. The psalmist writes, whom have I in heaven but you? Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you that when your boss doesn't affirm you, even though you've worked hard and your boss doesn't affirm you, when your spouse doesn't affirm you, even though you've worked hard and your spouse doesn't affirm you, when your friends don't affirm you, even though you would die for them and they seem to not care all that much about you, when your parents don't affirm you, an A minus, why not an A plus? When society doesn't affirm you, when your church doesn't affirm you. Don't protect yourself by withdrawing into yourself, putting up defense mechanisms so that no one can hurt you. Don't do that. Don't promote yourself by saying, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to prove society wrong. I'm going to prove my spouse wrong. I'm going to prove my church wrong. You know what? I'm going to prove everybody wrong. Don't do that either. Humbly acknowledge. I am dependent on God. I am 100% dependent on God. For everything. Humbly acknowledge our dependence on God. Verse 12 through 15. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of the earth. The third tool that I'll give you to interpreting the book of Psalms is look up metaphors. It's poetry, so it's filled with metaphors. You have to look these up. You'll miss out on so much truth if you don't look these up. Look up the metaphors. Look up them if you're like, where do I look it up? Get a study Bible. Get a commentary. Uh, get a pastor who has those things and can look them up for you. Or get something. Look them up and find out what they mean. In verse 12, the psalmist is talking about bulls. Now, if we use the term bulls today, that doesn't mean anything. And certainly, bulls of Bashan doesn't mean anything. We read that, and often we just skip over that. Bulls of Bashan, okay, I don't know. But if we said wolf of Wall Street, or sharks of Wall Street, or suits of Washington, we know exactly what that means. We understand those to mean success, pride, Achievement. That's how they understood bulls of Bashan. Remember, they are in an agrarian society. Bashan was a fertile area. It had 24 inches of rainfall a year, which is a lot for that area. It was known for its green grass, its wheat, its oaks, and its cattle. So when the psalmist says bulls of Bashan, he's using a metaphor to describe human success and wealth and pride and achievement. It gives us insight into how he feels. I mean, isn't it one thing like if you feel like mocked and ridiculed by your peers, but when you feel mocked and ridiculed by the wealthy and the elite, and the, doesn't that make you feel even lower? This mocking and this scorn is so severe that it's affecting the psalmist physically. Look at verse 14 and 15. These are all metaphors in verse 14 and 15. Now, we don't use any of those. So let me kind of give you an equivalent, a modern day equivalent here. I am poured out like water is equivalent to like I'm spent. My bones are all out of joint or I'm all out of whack. My heart is like wax. I've lost my nerve. My strength is dried up. I can't even. So this psalmist is essentially saying, I'm spent, I'm all out of whack, I've lost my nerve, I can't even. This psalmist is ready to die. He says, you lay me in the dust. That's what he's saying. He's at such a low point, he's ready to die. Following God for the psalmist was tough. It always has been. 
following Jesus is tough. It always will be. But listen to the words of God. When we find ourselves in a similar situation as this psalmist, listen to the words of God and what he says. Jesus tells us, blessed, blessed, blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For great is your reward in heaven. Paul wrote, let us not grow weary of doing good. You ever grown weary? You ever tried to love someone that was hard to love and you just grew so weary of doing it? Let us not grow weary of doing good for we will reap in due season if we don't give up. Psalm 16 to 18, uh, uh, verse 22, uh, verse 16 to 18. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. The psalmist returns to the imagery of animals. Now you might think, well, dogs, oh man, that'd be nice if dogs encompassed me. I like dogs. Dogs in the ancient Near East were not household pets. One commentator wrote, uh, writes, Dogs came in many kinds and great numbers to garbage dumps. They ate whatever was thrown away. They carried diseases. They transmitted them to humans. They prowled about while snarling and looking for food. This is not a good imagery of dogs surrounding you. Now, I do believe that this psalm is happening to a real person in real history. It's not just a poem, it's not just a prophecy. This is happening to a real person, but again, we do see that this psalm is fulfilled in Jesus. When they crucified Jesus, they literally nailed his hands and his feet to wood. Luke tells us they stood by watching, just like here. That's pretty barbaric, right? Can you imagine like walking in the middle of a desert and seeing somebody like nailed to a piece of wood? suffocating to death, bleeding to death, and just, hmm, just stand there watching it. That's pretty barbaric, is it not? Luke says they stood by. They, they would go and watch people be crucified. And John writes, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to the bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it. Let's cast lots for it to see whose it will be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. You know what, you get what they're doing there? They're basically stealing the possessions of a man who's dying. They divide his garments. Each gets a piece. But the tunic doesn't have a seam. And the only way to divide it would be to rip it completely, making it useless. And so they cast lots. Let's gamble to see who gets this. Who would want to wear the tunic of a man who was crucified? I like what D.A. Carson writes. He says, Jesus laid aside his garments, his outer garments, when he washed his disciples' feet in an act that anticipated the cleansing that would issue from his death. So here he loses his clothes, all of his clothes. This same self-humbling operates, but here to the last degree as he lays aside his glory. And by this act and the divine paradox is glorified. Yet while his last earthly possessions are stripped from him, he remains under his father's sovereign care, even as his tunic is not torn and destroyed. Verse 19 to 21. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. 
Once, Joe. Once again, we see our contrasts. These contrasting words of yet and but are great sources of hope for us. This is a pretty dismal picture up until this point. He feels as though God has forsaken him. God is not near. God doesn't care about his groaning. He's treated as a worm and not a man. He's scorned and despised. He's mocked and ridiculed. The prideful and the successful are gloating over him. He's physically drained and spent. They're even taking advantage of him and being entertained by his plight. That's pretty dismal. Does it get any lower than that? What possible hope does he have? How is he going to pull himself up out of this discouragement, out of this despair? How is he going to do that? He's not. God will. God will. He's going to play on the one string he has. It's the one string that you have. It's the one string that I have. It's the one string that every human being has. To throw himself upon the mercy and grace of God. He's going to cry out and trust that his father cares for him. Look at the words he uses. Help, deliver, save, rescue. And here's what I want us to see and feel. That God is able and willing to help, deliver, save, and rescue us. Why? Because he didn't help, deliver, save, and rescue Jesus. Now certainly he's going to at the resurrection. But in this moment, on Good Friday, what we celebrate this Friday, the reason that God is able to help you and save you and rescue you and deliver you is because on this day of Good Friday, God didn't deliver Jesus. He unleashed his wrath upon him. Forsaking him. Abandoning him. For millennium after millennium after millennium after millennium, Jesus had never known for one nanosecond separation from his Father. He had perfect unity, perfect joy, perfect harmony. And on this day, he was abandoned by his Father. For you. For me. On this day for our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. Just as the psalmist takes all of his circumstances, all of his plight, all of his discouragement, all of his depression, all of his hopelessness, and he goes back to the character of God, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, friends, guests, visitors, I want to encourage you to take all of your suffering and trials and hopelessness and discouragement and despair and go back to the cross of Christ. Not just this week, especially this week, but not just this week, that when you are down in the dumps, maybe you feel good today, it's a sunny day, it's a happy day, you know, but there's, darkness will come. And this week or this month or this year when you are feeling down in the dumps and despair, discouragement, why can't I get a spouse? Why can't I get a job? Why can't I get this person to love me? Why can't I get my boss to see what I'm doing? Why can't life be better for me? Why can't this? When you are down in the dumps, I want to encourage you to go back to the cross and to see a Savior that is bleeding for you because He loves you, because He is rescuing you. And to find your worth there. Not in your boss. 
not in your parents, not in your spouse, but at the cross. It's the only thing that will rescue you in that moment. Nothing else will. Now, God might use a good friend or a good word from the... You know, he might use a medium for that. But this psalmist has no hope. His only hope is the character of God. Your only hope is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's it. Verse 22 to 31. And close out looking at this as one giant section. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praises in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. There is such a dramatic shift from verses 1 to 21 to 22 to 31, that some scholars believe these are supposed to be two different psalms. And they just got combined. Psalm 22, 1 to 21, is essentially a psalm of lament with some hope mixed in. But it's really a psalm of lament. But Psalm 22, 22 to 31, is a psalm of praise. There's no lamenting in here at all. How do we make sense of this? Is this supposed to be two different psalms? I see no good reason to treat it as such, nor do the translators. In fact, there are many psalms where it switches between lament and praise. It's one of the great things about the book of Psalms. Because don't we do that? You ever had a bad day in the morning and a great day in the evening? Or a great day in the morning and a bad day in the evening? This is how life is. We can even summarize this contrast in one of the phrases of the psalms. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That may be the opposite for our millennial culture. Joy comes in the night and weeping comes in the alarm clock in the morning. But they were uh, opposite of a nocturnal society. Um, Psalm 126, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy. I think one of the things that we learn from this contrast that we see in the Psalms is our need to praise God in the midst of our suffering and our trials. Our need to worship. To get out from under ourselves or get over ourselves. You ever been there where like you're just like self is such a burden to you or self is such a yeah. And so often when we find ourselves in either of those two, we need to worship God. And listen, that's not to minimize our pain and our suffering or discouragement, all right? I think we can all agree that when we read this psalm, this is real pain. This is real suffering. This is real discouragement. This is real depression. <clears throat> Absolutely. We can all agree on that. We've all felt that on some level. If you haven't, you will. But I also know that sometimes the only way to get out from under that, when I find myself so discouraged that I can't even move on, like I, 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 it's just all about me, I'm so discouraged, I find in that moment the only way to get out from under that is to praise God, to worship God. 
to look at God, to worship and praise God, to get over myself. The psalmist remembers three things here. Number one, God is good. Two, God is in control. And three, God is worth it. He remembers that God is good. Look at verse 24. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. Here the psalmist affirms, yes, God does hear us when we cry to him. He does. God sees us. God hears us. God cares about us. Preach that to yourself when you find yourself suffering or sad or discouraged. Verse 26, A, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. You ever felt sad and like you just needed to eat? Maybe right now you're feeling that? Like, oh, man, I'm ready for that ramen. <laughs> feeling discouraged. If I just eat, I'll be happy. You ever had a bad day and you just needed to come home to a great meal? How much more when we feel bad do we need to come and eat at the Lord's table and pray and read His Word and sing praises to Him? The afflicted eat and are satisfied. He remembers that God is in control. Verse 28, for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. The psalmist was able to find hope because he remembered that God is in control. Jesus was able to go to the cross because he knew that his Father was in control. We are able to pick up our cross because we know our Father is in control. And three, he remembers that God is worth it. Look at verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Look at verse 29. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Worship is essentially saying, God, you are worth it. You are worth my worship. You are worth it. This week, as we get ready for Good Friday and Easter, I want to encourage us to reflect on this truth. How much does God have to love us to be willing to pour out His wrath on His Son? I love you guys dearly, but I would not harm a hair on my son's head for you. I don't love you that much. How much does God have to love us to pour out divine wrath for all time on his son? That should not make you feel condemned that should make you feel so unbelievably loved. How much does Jesus have to love us to be willing to be abandoned by His Father for you and for me? How much does He have to love us?